off to an early start in 2020. The Florida legislative session uh, convenes next Tuesday, January 14th. Tonight, we are on the air with members of the local Northwest Florida legislative delegation, and they want to know what's on your mind. We are live and interactive on radio and on television. From the Phyllis and Mike Johnson studio, it's Legislative Review, Dialogue with the Delegation. This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. Good evening and Happy New Year. Thank you so very much for joining us. I'm Jeff Weeks. In addition to our television broadcast on WSRE TV, we're also being heard on News Radio 92.3 FM and AM 1620. Abortion, guns, and money will likely provide plenty of headline material for this year's Florida legislative session. Lawmakers will tackle a controversial piece of legislation regarding parental consent for minors who want to have an abortion. Gun laws or lack thereof will inspire plenty of debate and Governor DeSantis hopes to put some extra money in the pockets of Florida teachers as part of his proposed $91.4 billion budget. And it's an election year. All that said, the fireworks in Tallahassee are likely to last well past New Year's Eve. On tonight's Legislative Review, we want to know what's important to you. What are the issues that Northwest Florida is most concerned about? This is a forum for you to speak directly to your legislative delegation. You can do so by email or phone. The email address is questions at WSRE.org. Or if you prefer, you can call us at 850-484-1223 or toll free at 1-800-239-WSRE. We're joined this evening by members of the Northwest Florida Legislative Delegation. Senator Doug Broxson serves District 1. He is chair of the Banking and Insurance Committee. He also serves on Agriculture, Military and Veterans Affairs, Space and Domestic Security, Community Affairs and the Joint Committee on Public Council Oversight. District 2 Senator George Gaynor was unable to be with us this evening. He is chair of the Committee on Finance, Tax and he is also vice chair of Agriculture as well as serving on Appropriations and Military and Veterans Affairs and Space. From the Florida House of Representatives, Jayer Williamson serves House District 3. Representative Williamson is chair of the Government Operations and Technology Appropriations Subcommittee and vice chair of the Workforce Development and Tourism Subcommittee. He also serves on Appropriations, Commerce, and the Joint Legislative Budget Commission. Alex Andrade serves House District 2. Representative Andrade serves on the Commerce Committee, Criminal Justice Subcommittee, Health Market Reform Subcommittee, Oversight, Transparency, and Public Management Subcommittee, and the Government Operations and Technology Appropriations Subcommittee. Mike Hill represents District 1. He was unable to join us this evening. Representative Hill serves on the Judiciary Committee and the Civil Justice Subcommittee, as well as Pre-K through 12 Innovation Subcommittee. House District 4 Representative Mel Ponder also unable to join us this evening. Representative Ponder is Majority Deputy Whip and is Chair of the Children, Family and Seniors Subcommittee as well as serving on Health and Human Services, Energy and Utilities, and Ways and Means. Gentlemen, welcome. Happy New Year into a brand new decade. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Thank you for having us. Great to, great to have you. The session's off to an early start this year. What's kind of top of mind? I'll begin with you, Senator Broxson. What's, what's the biggest thing you're facing this year? Well, I think with a, a new governor at looking at the issues in South Florida, water continues to be a big issue, that and wastewater. We have some problems here, but nothing like they're having in South Florida. So the governor is going to continue to push to take care of the Everglades, make sure that the runoff from septic tanks and other pollutants will not affect the drinking water and the quality of life. And all this affects tourism. So we've got to make sure that we maintain a stable uh, environment in, in order to have people come and visit us by the hundreds of thousands. 
and people moving here. I, there was just a report out today, I believe Bloomberg Business Week had a, had a report out saying that people are fleeing New York and places like that. And guess where the bulk of them are coming to? Right. <laughs> the Sunshine State. So the, the, very, uh, the, the, we're growing for sure, for sure. Representative Williamson, what, what, what are you thinking about? What's on your mind? Sure, and there's a lot of people moving to the state of Florida. And it's because we have a tax um, structure that's in place that's good for businesses, it's good for people, and that's why they want to be here in the state of Florida. It's a good problem to have. It also creates some challenges, though, uh, when you have more people coming in, you have more usage of your in infrastructure and other things like that, which I know will address some of those infrastructure needs over this session. Um, you know, personally, and I think with the delegation, we have to look at uh, still we have people in Panama City who are hurting mm -hmm. from a storm, even though we uh, the state came through last year, there's still more work that needs to be done to help people get back in their homes and get, get jobs in Panama City. And, and we always uh, work together as a panhandle delegation to make sure we come together, lock arms, and uh, we're going to help Representative Trumbull and uh, Senator Gaynor to make sure we do everything we can for, uh, for Bay County and Panama City. Um, and uh, me personally, going to be looking at the budget and uh, have been able to uh, sit on a committee and chair a committee that's in appropriations world and making sure that we can bring some money home. We, uh, our people that are out there listening and watching uh, today, they send a lot of money to Tallahassee. We need to make sure we bring some of that back to Northwest Florida. Representative Andrade, kind of what's top of mind for you? Uh, what's top of mind is, is very similar to what uh, Representative Williamson just discussed. Um, you know, the first thing is the, the Congress in D.C. discussed uh, eliminating the SALT tax, right, the state and local income tax. Uh, and that's why we, you do have uh, people coming from high-tax states coming to Florida. Uh, and that's why we do have a population uh, increasing by nearly 1,000 people every single day. Um, you know, we have over 50% of our Florida population still in septic tanks. And that causes a huge uh, crisis when you're discussing, you know, where those nutrients go, you know, when people, you know, come and, and move into homes. And we have to work on our, our, our water quality to make sure that we're continuing to uh, preserve our environment for future, future generations. Um, you know, we, we do have to continue making sure that uh, Representative Trumbull in his district and uh, Representative Schof, uh, who's in House District 7 this, this year in his first session, uh, make sure that uh, they feel supported by us because they are still recovering from Hurricane Michael. Mm -hmm. um, and we also do have to accommodate for the fact that uh, the governor rightly uh, noted that we have, one, one of the highest performing education systems in the country. Uh, I believe that we're ranking out at uh, between you know number three and number four in the country as far as states performing in public schools, uh, but our teachers are underpaid, mm -hmm. uh, and so the governor proposed uh, you know in his 91.4 billion dollar budget proposal, uh, increasing starting teacher pay to over 47 thousand dollars a year, and we have to figure out how to how to make ends meet and accommodate some of those asks to make sure that teachers uh, who have other opportunities because our economy is is incredible right now. Yeah. Um, teachers who have other opportunities to stay in those classrooms and continue, uh, you know, out kicking their, their, their coverage, you know, doing far more than they're getting paid to do uh, because our students depend on it. So, so making sure that those ends meet, making sure that the budget is correct, and making sure that our teachers and our, our staff in prisons right now are getting the funding they need uh, to, to be adequately staffed is something we have to absolutely address this year. Jeff, I'd like to circle sure. back on what you talked about with the influx of new people coming mm -hmm. to state. The census looks like it's going to be, come in around 22 million. And many of these folks, although they're fleeing states that have high taxes and regulations, when they come to Florida, they bring that same mentality with them. It's re very concerning. If you looked at, at Florida and Texas, that clearly has led the nation in, in responsible government, paying down debt, not having low taxes, having quality of life. Why do we have such a change? And we are seeing it primarily in the Senate where we potentially could lose our majority as Republicans. How does that happen? How do you, do you put a uh, sign up and have a test that someone takes before they come across the border? <laughs> that, hey, if you're leaving one thing, don't bring it with you. So we, we wanna make sure that we do what's right for the people of Florida and send that message that we're doing a good job taking care of their tax pair money. And interestingly enough, uh, the report I was referring to that I heard on the radio before coming over here, but yeah, New York, uh, people are leaving New York and Illinois and, and the you know, and, and other places yeah. too, but those seem to be the two main that, that they are targeting the Sunshine State. Yeah. It's <laughs> so. hilarious to me that New York, who has less of a population than Florida, has, I believe, 60% of a higher <clears throat> state budget than Florida does. Yeah. And kind of tells you how they're taxing their citizens every single day. And there was, I guess, just a couple of years ago, we surpassed New York in population. So California, Texas, and Florida.
right? Very biggest. Anyway, I mentioned that some of the you know hot button issues as we roll into 2020 here, and we have uh, an awful lot of questions. Our viewers and listeners have been on a phenomenal job of emailing in some great questions, so I'm going to get going with those questions. So let's begin with a, a viewer question here on abortion, and uh, the question is, do you support the passage of House Bill 265, which requires a physician to have written notarized parental consent before they can legally perform an abortion on a minor. Uh, let me start with you. Sure. Uh, I mean, absolutely, yes. Um, I think that there should be parental consent uh, when it comes to having an abortion, something we worked on last year and uh, just couldn't get it across the finish line uh, in both chambers, but we're, uh, we'll be back at that again. I mean, just, just for the fact of it being a medical procedure, I think that a child that's 13, 14, 15 years old, their parents should be notified and should know about that procedure, especially with it being an abortion, but I 100% support that bill. Representative Andrade? I couldn't agree more. Uh, I remember last year, my first session, we were debating uh, this bill, uh, as well as the Sanctuary Cities bill, until about 2 a.m. on the House floor several times. Um, you know, it, it's, there, there's absolutely no question that we need to support this bill. Um, you know, I think one thing that's missed in, in southern states is that Florida is special in the fact that uh, in the late 80s, we actually passed a constitutional amendment uh, saying that we, know, we not only have a right to privacy, we have a right to be left alone. Uh, so we have a very unique set of case law. And as we continue to work towards uh, preserving that right to life, we have to take these incremental steps like uh, this parental consent bill to actually work, path, work, work through, create new case law, and, and work towards that same right to life that other south, southern states are working on right now. Senator Broxham? I co-sponsored that bill with uh, uh, Senator Stargell is, is taking on that load, and she's very excited about it. But let me put it in comparison. If your child has to take an aspirin, they have to call home to get permission, but they don't have to call home to have an abortion. That makes no sense at all. This is simply a common sense approach to making sure that we're taking care of our children and doing the responsible thing. Okay. Here's another uh, viewer question here. Recreational marijuana. Do you support the legalization of recreational marijuana? And I'll begin with you, Representative Andrade. Uh, so when you, when you talk about recreational marijuana, what you're talking about is... Um, you know, allowing for that use, but within some type of governmental framework. Um, you know, we allow for recreational alcohol use, but it's within a governmental framework. Uh, so the question that we really have to grapple with, you know, this session and sessions in the future is, what does that regulatory and framework look like, and how do we enforce that? You know, because if people are starting uh, to be legally uh, using marijuana recreationally, uh, they're going to be driving impaired potentially, and how do we enforce that? Uh, and down the line, the same way we do with alcohol. With, with alcohol. Um, and so working through that process is something that we're going to continue having to do. Uh, but yeah, no, currently, I, I, the, the war on drugs has been a massive cost to Florida taxpayers. Um, we pay, pay well over $2 billion a year to our Florida prison systems. Um, and I'm working on criminal justice reforms this year. Um, you know, uh, there's, Florida voters have, have spoken already, allowing for medical use of marijuana. Um, allowing for recreational is, is, is something that Florida voters, I believe, right now will support. Um, but making sure that regulatory framework is in place is something that we, as legislators, need to continue to be focused on. Senator Broxson? Well, actually, the decision will not be ours. It will be made, has been, and will be made by the voters. There's going to be a, a ballot initiative this year that will amp up the use of marijuana. We went from medical marijuana to now we're going to have recreational. And those will be issues that we will manage and not have to vote on them, frankly. I think we're moving mighty fast. It's kind of a gold rush in all these states to see not only uh, what we do with the product, but who's going to grow it, how it's going to be grown, will it be in any way safe, and will there be safety guards put around it. So it's a very complicated issue. We, we dealt with hemp last year. Hemp has presented real opportunities, but there's a lot of problems that we have to do as far as what we do to produce it and get it to the marketplace. So we will have to figure all that out. There'll be a lot of criticism for how we do it, how slow we go or how fast we go. Okay. But uh, it, it is something that the citizens have spoken. And I believe uh, based on what we see in polling, we'll probably see those numbers about what they were for, for uh, medical marijuana. 
Representative Williamson? Sure, and, and I think the, the key words that have been said is, is a very complicated issue. And uh, that framework of how things would be put together uh, will be extremely important. I, um, I'm worrisome, um, you know, as a, as a business owner. Um, how does that work with employees uh, on the job, um, driving your work vans or showing up on jobs representing your company? Uh, how that would work, how that framework would, would work. Now, medical marijuana, 100%. I've been old, on board uh, and very supportive of medical marijuana from the very beginning and will continue to. But I think, like Representative Andrade and Senator Broxson said, that framework and how it's implemented uh, is very complex and it's going to be, uh, the devil will be in the details when it comes to that. Speaking of medical marijuana, another viewer is asking the question, would you publicly support the right of current and future medical cannabis patients to grow their own medical cannabis for strictly personal use I really don't know what that looks like frankly I I, I think once you start having personal uh, use that uh, you grow your own you probably be growing it for your neighbors and your subdivision so uh, without some regulation it's going to be the wild wild west and I don't think any of us want to see that yeah, it, would, it would be a Pandora's box if you open that up. Um, but again, how does that look? What does it look like uh, in legislation? And, and how would you implement everything? Uh, but I do feel that would be a Pandora's box that would be open. Representative Andrew, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I, so uh, again, I, um, they're not, it's not apples, you know, apples to apples, it's apples to oranges. There's a distinction between the two, but um, you know, we, we allow for home brewing of beer right now. And uh, I don't think anyone's ever knocked anybody's door for home distilling. Um, you know, it would be something that I'd have to think through a little bit more in depth and consider the, the concerns and the distinctions, but uh, I wouldn't say right now that I'm opposed to it. It's, it would have to be something that you have to think through a little bit more in depth to determine whether or not it is similar to what we already allow with, with home brewing and home distilling. Okay. Here's something that's been in the news an awful lot lately, and um, a viewer is asking the question, talking about vaping. and. She says, "Will you please make shutting down the va make, uh, make shutting down the vaping industry in Florida, the vape industry in Florida, a priority?" She says, "My son was born and raised in Pensacola. Less than eight years he, uh, ago, he started vaping, and it killed him uh, in October. It's not a safer alternative to smoking, and it's killing our children a lot faster than cigarettes." And of course, that's been all over the news on, on nationally. It's been a, it's, it's a problem. What, what are your thoughts? on some sort of regulatory or legal action? Well, this is really something, thankfully, the federal government has gotten involved in and sent a pretty strong message that they're going to control it from the top. Uh, it is a problem because we really don't know what people are vaping. And the, it, it certainly is something that Florida is going to have to look at and make sure that we uh, take care of our citizens and make sure that uh, their health is not inflicted by some of these habits. And it, oh, go ahead. Sure. I mean, I was just going to say I'm, I'm very libertarian on some issues uh, like this. We, we've seen that vaping, first of all, it's a major problem in schools, and we have to figure out how do we tackle that because, um, you know, growing up in high school, didn't know very many people that smoked. It was tough to do that on a high school campus. Now you have children that can walk into a bathroom, um, they can use a, a vape pen, and it, it unless you catch them in the act, there's no way to know if, if it's happening. So it truly is a, a problem in high schools. But as somebody who's more libertarian on these type issues, there's personal responsibility. And you have to choose um, certain things in your life. And there are things that um, I choose, there are things that other people choose that may be you know, good, bad, or indifferent for you, but you have that right and you have that um, you have the right to choose you know, how, what you do to your body. Some people don't want anybody to drink, but people have that right to make the choice. And, and that's where I'm at when it comes to vaping. When we've seen some of the uh, medical issues that have arised, a lot of it's been black market. Um, so uh, I do think that there's a lot of things we have to learn about vaping and the call, you know, some of the things that it may cause. But when you look at the studies, a lot of the negative effects have been black market vaping, which we've, we've got to figure out how to tackle that. But the legal uh, vape pens and everything, I, I don't see, uh, let somebody have that choice if that's what they want to do. It may not be what I do, it may not be what the representative or the senator does, but they have that right to make the choice. Mm -hmm. and, uh, well, first, my heart goes out to that mother who, who submitted that question. Um, but when we're you know, sitting in Tallahassee, what we're actually doing is trying to apply um, what we swore to uphold in our oath in the Constitution uh, to what we believe is in the best interest of the Florida voters and the Florida, our Florida constituents. 
Um, when you're when you're talking about um, nicotine products, it's already illegal to sell nicotine to minors. Mm -hmm. uh, so the the real issue is an enforcement issue at that level below 18 years old, below, below the age of ma majority. Um, 18 year olds in the United States right now are considered adults. You know they have the right to vote, they have the right to enlist in the military. They have they are imbued with every single fundamental constitutional right that our U.S. Constitution grants to them. Uh, so when we start, you know, discussing kind of age restrictions that have been floated out between, you know, like like saying, uh, you know, you have to be 21 years old to buy nicotine, um, you know, I, I do tend to put my libertarian hat on for a moment and say, what's what's the purpose? Are we actually treating 18 year olds like adults, or are we not? And what discussion should we actually be having? Mm -hmm. um, you know, when you're talking about a lot of these products, especially the 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 larger products that take up take up a larger uh, portion of the market share. Um, you know, these companies are being very responsible and they are being treated like cessation products for people who are in uh, that age of majority and above. Um, you know, so, so knee-jerk reactions, responses to, to individual news reports, um, that's something that we as legislators need to be wary of, need to be intelligent on, and actually have to dig in on the details to, to determine what's in the best interest of Florida voters and what and how do we treat Florida adults. You know, um, you know I know I probably have a different perspective because I'm 30. Um, I'm definitely the youngest person here, uh, you know. But but you Close. turn eight, you turn 18, you turn 18. You have the right to vote. You are an American right. adult citizen imbued with every single fundamental right that our Constitution gives you. Uh, and any time we start imposing age restrictions because we believe that you're too young as an adult, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna raise a red flag. I'm gonna dig deeper on it because I don't believe that that's necessarily the best idea. I think some of this is going to be flushed down in the courts too, with the trial lawyers getting involved and in, in, you know asking and, and asking the question. And I'm not saying one way or the other. I'm just simply asking the question: Did the companies target you know underage? So that'll be interesting to watch. Just absolutely as an aside there. Um, while we're on smoking, another viewer question here: Should Florida's uh, counties be allowed to ban smoking at parks and beaches? So should we be able to say can't smoke in the park? You know, can't smoke in, on the beaches and stuff. Well, the idea. Well, I guess, you know, people's rights not to have to inhale secondhand smoke or not, for that matter, the litter that it causes. I don't know. Are we getting too much into people's business at that point? I, I, to me, it's, um, it's an overstep to say that a, a couple that goes out to the beach and want to share a, a drink of wine and the husband wants to smoke a cigar, um, I don't think the government needs to be making that choice for them. Of course, I don't want to be around a lot of smoke myself, but still, you know, I'll also have my own right to move down the beach a little bit further to walk down and get, get away from it. I just think that that's an overstep of government. That's my personal opinion. Anybody want to add anything to that? Or? Uh, one of the greatest beauties about uh, Florida's government over the past, you know, over 20 years is that we've we've been a pr we've allowed to our our market to kind of dictate where we're going to go. We've been very responsible tax wise. When we've allowed private citizens to make those decisions, um, I agree with Representative Williamson that um, when you start trying to restrict things on on public property, uh, you really have to be careful about what the justification is. And if the Constitution isn't granted, you doubly have to be careful about, about, about what the justification is. Okay, very good. Let's move on. Uh, minimum wage, should Florida's minimum wage be raised to $15 an hour? Well, again, I think that's gonna be a, a constitutional initiative and it may not be our decision to make, but uh, we know that if you arbitrarily raise uh, minimum wage, you're gonna have the cost of the services increase. So you're really imposing something on businesses on their profitability. So I, is the public willing to pay more for the product? Because that's what it's going to end up costing is uh, more as we buy these different things, whether it's a McDonald's hamburger or we go to the drugstore. Mm -hmm. Anybody want to add to that? Or? Yeah, I'm going to agree with every single demand side economist I've ever spoken to and say <laughs> that no, we shouldn't arbitrarily increase the minimum wage. Um, you know, when you start talking about what effect that would actually have, and you discuss that with employers, um, you know, when you start talking about new technology, the question for most employers is, uh, am I going to expend the financial means necessary to switch from an employee to new technology? Will it cost me more than two years of employment? If we're going to almost double the minimum wage, you're going to vastly increase and exacerbate 
the question about whether or not you know employers are going to invest in new technology and you're going to result in, in less employment. Um, so I think the people that are really pushing this, this issue uh, on the Constitution aren't thinking about the fact that this is going to hurt a lot of people uh, who are right now making minimum wage at jobs that will be replaced by new technology in the future. Right, and I don't have anything significant that I can add to what the senator and the representative said, but no, I would not support it. Okay. This is actually a question uh, directed right at Representative Andrade, and it says uh, Representative Andrade has uh, sponsored uh, House Bill 843 for alimony reform. Will you, and so this, I guess, will be to, 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 the, to the other two here, will you be supporting this legislation, and will you co-sponsor? Oh, man. <laughs> so, so, I don't you no want to talk, pressure, a, yeah. you want to talk a little bit about the bill? Uh, yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, so, so, House Bill 80, 843, uh, is a bill to, to try and, and fix the issues that we've identified in alimony uh, or alimony law here in Florida. Uh, for one, it hasn't been revised in over 30 years. Uh, we're one of six states in the entire country that still allows for permanent alimony, meaning if you want to retire in the state of Florida, you have to ask a judge permission uh, to retire. If the judge determines that you're not allowed to retire, you have to continue working to pay that alimony. Uh, so. Uh, you know, the question, uh, in fact, that my wife, who, by the way, makes more money than I do as an attorney right now, uh, posed to me is, if we stayed married and I wanted to retire, uh, could I ask a judge to force you to continue working to, to, <laughs> in, to increase our income? Um, the purpose of the bill, uh, it, it's well-meaning. Um, you know, I've heard from practitioners, especially here in the Panhandle, in family law, and judges here in the Panhandle uh, who, pra who serve in family law, who say we need more guidelines and instructions. Uh, so that people who are going through probably one of the most difficult times in their life can predict out, you know, what the results will be on alimony, on time sharing with their children, uh, who should 100% be the, mo the major focus uh, in any divorce proceeding, uh, and reduce the amount that they have to pay to attorneys to figure it out. Uh, because people are losing significant swaths of their, net, of their, of their personal income and value uh, in paying attorneys to try and litigate issues that should be far more predictable in a state the size of Florida. You'd like to add to it? Uh, I think alimony reform is definitely the question that no married legislator really wants to answer on TV. <laughs> so we appreciate the call for uh, calling that in tonight. Thank you for that. Um, hopefully my wife is uh, putting the kids in bed right now. But um, it, uh, you know, I have not looked at the bill, sorry, Representative Andrade, no uh, but I think that it's something, there, there needs to be reform there. Um, again, like anything we do, the devil's in the details, uh, and we have to look about how that's implemented, and I look forward to learning about it from the good representative uh, from Pensacola. We so, actually passed uh, through the House and the Senate several years ago, and uh, Governor Scott vetoed right. the alimony bill, so uh, we'd probably have to ask the, uh, Governor DeSantis what he thinks about it. Okay. <laughs> Very good. Very I'm good. Hopeful. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, if you would like to submit a question, you can do so via email, questions at WSRE.org, or if you'd just like to call in, feel free to do so, and they will relay the question to me. The uh, number is 800-239-WSRE or 850-484-1. Two, two, three, and of course we are being seen on television and also heard on radio on News Radio ninety two point three FM and News Radio AM sixteen twenty. We greatly appreciate our broadcast partners in that endeavor. Moving on to the next question from one of our viewers: Do you support Senate Bill thirteen oh eight that would allow a judge to review the sentences of certain offenders convicted under the age of twenty five? The goal of this bill is to reduce, according to the, to the viewer here, the goal of this bill is to reduce Florida's prison population of 95,000 inmates. Senator Broxson, you want to comment? Well, I actually spoke with uh, Senator Brandis today. At, he's uh, moving uh, those issues along in the Senate, and it's really called the second look bill. Do we, as a person who's 16, 18, 19 years old, do they have the potential of changing when they become a, a responsible adult? And uh, surveys around the country say they do have a good potential unless you keep them in jail and then it becomes more complicated because their behavior changes. I think we've got to do something. We're going to be facing over overpopulation fairly soon. We certainly are understaffed in the prison system by about 30 percent. So we, we know how to send people to jail. Now we've got to find people that can take care of them and if we can find a way to get the ones that would never commit a crime back into society, we should consider that option. 
And I, I don't know uh, the specifics on that bill, but I know in the past when we've discussed it, it's, we're not talking, we're talking nonviolent offenses. Um, so I think it's something that we do need reform there. And uh, we just have to, to look and make sure that we, obviously we don't want people on the streets who are going to uh, hurt other people in society. Um, but I think there are people that definitely deserve second chances. There are things that people do when they're 18, 16, 18, 20, 25 years old, and that doesn't define who they are as a person for the rest of their life, and it shouldn't. Right, and, and actually, before I get to you, uh, Representative Andrade, the, another viewer had, had written in and, and asking about uh, House Bill 339, drug trafficking offenses, which I believe you're sponsoring. And yeah. so maybe kind of dovetail into, into that. Talk yeah. a little bit about that and then your thoughts on. No, absolutely. Um, so we've, we've, we've touched on it, uh, uh, and Senator Brock and Representative Williamson have both really analyzed the issue very well just now. Um, uh, one of the main reasons I asked uh, Speaker Oliva to let me serve on the Criminal Justice Subcommittee this session, as opposed to last session, um, you know, is because I care deeply about this issue. It's why I filed House Bill 339, um, which works to, to roll back some of the mandatory minimum sentencing processes that we have in Florida. Um, the game is recidivism. If we're going to say that we are conservative Republicans, we have to make sure that we're analyzing um, and making sure that we're spending taxpayer dollars in the best way possible. Uh, for, for those at home, uh, recidivism uh, is the rate at which people who are incarcerated and are released return back to prison. Uh, right now in Florida, with our almost 100,000 prisoners that we have uh, serving in state prisons, and that does not include state uh, county jails, um, we have 30% of people who are released from state prisons return back to prison within three years, and almost 60% return back within six. Uh, House Bill 339 uh, addresses uh, drug trafficking offenses specifically, and like Rep Representative Williamson said, uh, it's focused on these nonviolent drug trafficking offenses, because we know with data um, that when you sentence someone to 15 years for a drug trafficking offense, uh, they're not going to come back uh, after they're released. And we also know that they're uh, a far, at far less risk if we release them within eight years of returning back because these types of drug trafficking offenses uh, borne out by data uh, indicate that the people who are sentenced to them uh, once released, they don't re-violate. They become contributing members of society. Uh, so we're, I'm excited. Uh, in Florida, we've had um, you know, several legislators who've been brave and bold in the past. I think uh, Representative Chris Sprouse uh, who's going to take over as a speaker uh, in the next session after this one, uh, has been a major champion of collecting data and making sure that we're making data-driven policy, best policy decisions in the criminal justice context. Uh, Senator Brandis, uh, Senator Bradley have also been champions in the past. I think Florida, and I'm excited to see Florida in the very near future, um, really be a trendsetter across the country uh, when it comes to making better uh, criminal justice policy decisions. Uh, I'm excited to hopefully play a role. Okay. Jeff, very quickly, Texas oh, sure. did a study that they spent a lot of money on and a lot of time that said this about prisons. There's three types. There's those that uh, cannot be helped. That's about a third of the prisoners. They will never be rehabilitated. There's the ones in the middle that have some chance of rehabilitation. And then there's a third that would never be going back to prison again. The problem we have in Florida is that we have, we don't dichotomize them. If you go to one of our reception centers, which is what the county jail sends a adjudicated prisoner to, much of the decision on where they will end up their sentence or the start of their sentence would be based on their behavior that weekend. Not on their crime, but on their behavior. So we, we have to do a better job of making sure that third that would never come back does not end up in places that will cause them to change their behavior for the rest of their life and never be a productive citizen. So we're digging into that. We've got to do something. It's important. I'll guarantee you the three of us get more calls on people, loved ones in prisons than any other subject that we deal with. And uh, we've got to do a better job of making sure that we're doing it right. Interesting. Move on to, to uh, gun safety and, and gun laws. Um, this particular question was uh, targeted for Representative Hill. He was unable to join us this evening, so we'll, we'll, we'll throw it out to, to the three of you here. But um, the viewer asked, uh, as the battle over gun safety measures continues to escalate, what is your opinion of the NRA-backed law 
that forbids Florida communities under the pain of stiff penalties from making regulations that promote gun safety and security measures. Right. Yeah, cool. I'll, I'll tackle that. To me, um, there, there should be preemption uh, at the state level. You should not drive from Pensacola to Key West and through every county or every city, municipality, or shopping district or whatever, there should not be a different set of laws when it comes to your gun rights. Um, to me, the framework should be at the state level. Uh, it should be consistent. And um, if I, if Santa Rosa County had something different than Escambia and Okaloosa and you drive through, you suddenly become a criminal in Santa Rosa County, but not in Escambia, to me that makes no sense when it comes to our, your you know, God-given right, your Second Amendment right, you should, uh, it should be the framework set at the state level to me. I know you guys are going to be talking about guns an awful lot in Tallahassee this session, I'm sure. And we had the awful, awful tragedy at Naval Air Station in Pensacola. And uh, apparently um, the, the shooter uh, acquired the gun through some sort of loophole. Can you guys talk a little bit about that and talk about how that may be addressed in Tallahassee this year? So the loophole is that whenever you, um, whenever you purchase a gun, you know, there, there's a set of questions, and I can't remember exactly which one it is, um, but it says uh, if you are a uh, U.S. national, I believe, that you mark, you can mark yes for, for U.S. citizen. Um, so that's the loophole. That's going to be resolved at the federal level. That's nothing that we're going to be able to do um, here in the, in the state of Florida, uh, but it'll be looked at at the federal level. I think... Uh yeah, well, yeah. Uh, one of the issues was that he applied for a hunter safety course as well, and he had a card saying that he'd passed the Florida uh, hunter safety course. Um, Florida is in a u unique position, and the fact uh, constitutionally we have uh, the the Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. Uh, it's a governor appointed board that creates laws. Um, they're not the legislature, but they create laws on the topic. Um, so I think that um, at a minute level, there might be some minor changes at the state level. Uh, it really does need to be handled at the federal level. And I want to um, just make a note and say that I really appreciate Governor DeSantis' response uh, to this shooting. Um, you know, he diverted his plane and came directly to Ananas, Pensacola. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he discussed immediately the fact that uh, yeah, Saudi Arabia needs to work to make these families, these victims whole. Uh, and then on Sunday, he came back to Escambia County. He, he, he came and he spoke at our, uh, our EOC, our Emergency Operations Center. Uh, and he said that the Second Amendment, uh, he's a fervent defender and believer in the Second Amendment, but it applies to American citizens. Um, so I, I hope um, that that message gets carried to the federal government. And I hope that um, while we, I believe that all three of us up here are staunch believers in the Second Amendment, uh, the federal government starts making sure that that kind of mistake doesn't happen again. Jeff, the president of the Senate sent out a, a press release today that uh, on opening day, the first before we conduct any business, we're going to honor the three families that, that lost a, a son. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have the Escambia County Sheriff's Department, the Highway Patrol there to honor them, the ones that were shot and the ones that participated. Uh, what a powerful statement we made to the rest of the state on how to respond to a tragedy. These men and women, without any notice, without any knowledge of what was happening inside of that uh, classroom, went directly to the fire. Yeah. And uh, that is such a act of courage. Yeah. Many of us would not do that. And we want to stand up as a Senate, and I'm sure the House, and tell these brave folks, thank you for what you do. Thank you for your willingness to not go home at night and be with your family because you're doing what, uh, what has to be done. And they did, they did a great job. They saved lives yep. and we're gonna honor them. And Sheriff Morgan wanna send a congratulations to him for the training that he gave his people to be able to perform at such a high level. Yeah, Jeff, I just wanna echo that. Um, uh, Speaker Oliva has uh, set aside time on opening day session to have a, a moment of silence for uh, especially the three uh, young, young men who died on base that day, uh, Joshua, Joshua Watson, Muhammad Haitham, and Cameron Walters. Um, uh, it's incredible to see the response that Pensacola's had. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't think after seeing what uh, occurred in 2016 with, with Captain Jeff Coos with the Blue Angels, we would have expected anything different from a community like Pensacola. Uh, but to see this community rally around those families uh, and the families of every single victim has been incredible. Yeah. I, you know, I, I, I just want to say, too, that, I mean, 
h how impressive our first responders are and were in that situation, law enforcement, the emergency medical, t everyone involved in that. I mean, it, it just really, it, it gives you, uh, it gives you just a great sense of pride of how top notch and first class the first responders in Northwest Florida are. And, Absolutely. And we, as you know, we had a trial uh, dealing with the behavior of what happened in Broward County with Parkland. Right. And to see the comparison of how yeah. we, we responded and how they responded there is such a testimony to the quality of people that we have here in law enforcement. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, it, moving on, we'll continue on because we've got several questions about guns and gun laws. Do you support allowing concealed weapon uh, permit holders to have guns on college and university campuses? I know that's something that's been jostled back and forth for, for quite a few years again, and I guess it's going to be on in the on-deck circle again this year. Yeah. Um, so. Jeff, as a, as a, somewhat of a realist, uh, I'm going to go ahead and say it's going to be a difficult one to pass. But um, one of the a, a, again, one of the main reasons that I asked uh, the House to allow me to serve on the Criminal Justice Subcommittee is to have these kinds of debates because I do believe um, that we should allow people to have uh, concealed carry firearms uh, on public property. Um, you know, I'm a fundamental believer in the Second Amendment. Uh, I don't believe that uh, uh, restrictions that aren't uh, well guided or well, you know, well thought out uh, should ever be imposed. Um, and I believe that any kind of restriction in that in that order um, should be heavily scrutinized before applying. So, um, yes, I would support that bill. Okay. Anybody else want to comment? Well, you have to keep in mind these campuses. It's really the wrong word for many of these large campuses. They're small cities, and to tell forty thousand people that they do not have the right to protect themselves is a powerful statement. And that's the will be the debate. And the college presidents will weigh in on it and hopefully we will come up with good public policy that makes sense. Representative Williams? Yeah, ab absolutely. I would support um, a bill that would allow people to carry on campuses. Okay. Um, here's another one and um, regarding guns. Do you support House Bill 6003, which would repeal the post-Parkland restrictions on guns, including raising the minimum age for gun purchases, imposing a three-day waiting period on most firearm purchases, and making it easier to invoke a red flag to confiscate firearms of those suffering from mental illness. Well, the Parkland bill was a very complicated bill, and in order to remember, uh, all the people that serve in this state are not uh, Republicans, conservative from from the Panhandle. Uh, we have people in South Florida that would have had 28 amendments added to the Parkland bill that would restrict every gun right in the state. So it was a mixed bag. I'll tell you this, our kids today are safer than they've ever been. We have uh, pr officers at most every school and be, by the time we get through next year, we'll have them in both private and public schools. So. We, you can be assured as a parent that we're doing everything we can to make sure your child gets off that bus in the afternoon and does not, will not be in harm's way. Yeah, and, it, and it was a very comprehensive bill. I think there was good things in it. I think there were things that I didn't like. Obviously, I voted against the bill. Um, and really, my sticking point was that 18 to 21 uh, raise when it comes to long uh, guns. I felt as as somebody who represents a lot of hunters. I mean, people grow up hunting and, and, and uh, a 19 year old should be able to buy that shotgun to go bird hunting. And, um, and that the 20 year old should be able to have a, a firearm in their house to defend themselves if somebody were to break in. So that was kind of my sticking point. Um, but I do think there were some very good things that, that make Florida safer and make our schools safer. Uh, but I, I certainly would uh, support something that put the age back to 18 instead of 21. Uh, I don't see that uh, passing this year, and my personal opinion is that it won't, but, uh, but I would support definitely the change from back to 18 instead of 21. Okay. Hey, let, let me backtrack here just a little bit on a subject that we had uh, talked about earlier on medical marijuana, because we've had somebody who has um, called in since we have been on the air, um, and this is important to him, obviously, because he's called in a couple of times, which is great. <laughs> um, but anyway, he, says, uh, the, uh, he wants to basically know, would you support legislation to make marijuana affordable to poor and low-income citizens? He says, I am a disabled uh, person, and uh, I don't want to be on opioids for pain. So that's an interesting uh, situation because we, you know, the opioids dilemma has obviously been in the news a lot and the issues surrounding that and now medical marijuana is legal and 
I mean, is there something that you would be support for people who perhaps don't necessarily have the means to go out and, and get medical marijuana? So uh, we're going to, I mean, we deal with insurance issues every, every single session. And what that question begs is how would you fund it? Because obviously the government's not going to arbitrarily subsidize uh, a private product. Uh, the question is going to be, uh, right now, is there a regulatory framework that prohibits medical insurance companies from providing coverage uh, for that type of medicinal use? Uh, and what are the, the federal restrictions on Medicaid and Medicare uh, you know, subsidies and, and coverage for that? Um, th that's a very complicated question. I applaud the, the gentleman who, who called it in and asked it. Um, you know, would, would I support a, a government subsidy of general revenue? Absolutely not. But would I, you know, consider and work through and spend the time to, to make sure that uh, insurance companies aren't prohibited from providing that coverage and making sure that we at the state level, at whatever capacity we participate uh, with Medicaid and Medicare, um, can allow for that use because we do have a constitutional right to medical marijuana? Yeah, I'd commit that time to working on that policy. Okay. I mean, I think that when you look at, at access to health care, obviously we want to make sure that citizens have that and they can get prescription drugs and whether that be um, pharmaceutical, whether that be medical marijuana or whatever it is, we want to make sure that people have access to it um, and if they need uh, medicine that they can get it. Uh, again, I, I, I don't think it should be subsidized, but I think we should do everything we can to make sure people get what they need uh, for their health. Okay. Brooks, well, like, you know, this is a new law, new new phenomenon in Florida, and it, it will be worked out. And I, I know a person that may be in pain that uh, needs a product that doesn't help them today, but uh, eventually, hopefully soon, Florida will be able to figure out why this is a part of the pharmaceutical solutions for our population. Okay. And a viewer from um, down in Niceville, Florida, we appreciate you watching. Um, what is being done to give felons back their right to vote, which passed in 2018? And as she says, three districts are working to actively implement, but Republican districts have failed to implement. Why? Oh, man, I love this question. <laughs> um, and, I, and I've taken it on in every public forum. Uh, so first, uh, Amendment 4 is what you're talking about. Uh, Amendment 4, uh, polling across the state has been conducted since. Um, and over 80% of people who voted for Amendment 4 understood Amendment 4 uh, to mean um, that you have your right to vote back after you've ser served the terms of your sentence and paid all fines and fees attenuated with your sentence. Um, that was the, uh, the bill that we passed last year to implement uh, that constitutional amendment. It's gotten a significant blowback, uh, many times unfair blowback, um, because uh, this wasn't a bill that we crafted. This was a constitutional amendment that was put on the ballot. Um, I visited prisons. I know Representative Williamson has visited prisons. I know Senator Broxton has visited prisons. Um, I want to assure everyone, the millions of viewers at home, um, that Republicans are not doing anything to try and disenfranchise any voters when they come out of prisons. And what we're trying to do is uh, enact a constitutional amendment that was put on the ballot. And what we're trying to do is interpret what it means. And what we have to interpret what it means is the polling data of the people who voted for it and the Supreme Court arguments made by the people who, who put this on the, on the ballot initially. And everyone, between the polling data of over 80% of Florida voters and the people who made this argument at the Florida Supreme Court, is that once you pay your, your, you know, your restitution to the victim of whatever crime you committed, and once you've served your time, you should be entitled to vote again. And we absolutely want to make sure that you have the right to vote again. Um, but we have, to couch, we have to make sure that we're being responsible uh, legislators in Tallahassee and not self-imposing our subjective interpretation of a constitutional amendment with what the voters actually told us to do. Okay. Anybody want to add to that? Or I'll, if not, I'll move on to the next question because we're getting short on time and I want to get a couple more in here. Um, do you support the passage of House Bill 195, which prohibits a government agency that receives a public records request to file a civil lawsuit against the individual who made the request? I mean, I've already voted for it, so yeah. Um, uh, okay. Um, uh, you know, I, as I, I do represent a uh, municipality here. Uh, in the panhandle. Um, and what you're talking about is you have local governments, especially in South Florida, because we have great acting local governments in the panhandle. Um, you have local governments in South Florida who, instead of asking uh, the Attorney General of Florida or First Amendment Florida, another, another group, 
um, whether or not something would be subject to a public records request, they're filing a lawsuit and making a private citizen who's made a public records request hire an attorney and go defend against this lawsuit. Uh, so yes, because there are two free options that are far more effective at answering the questions that some, some local governments have been trying to, to do, um, yes, I've, I've voted for the bill already this year. Okay. Anybody else want to add to that? Or? Nope. Okay. Very good. I had a great question, I thought, from um, one of our viewers down in Destin, Florida. And again, we appreciate you watching. Um, and and I'll, I guess I'll th let me just throw this out to all three. I mean, keep in mind, I have probably about eight minutes left here, but, but feel free to, to elaborate here. And I, I think the gentleman asked a wonderful question. How will you gauge your success this session? I'll, be, I'll begin with you, Senator Broxton. Well, we always, I, I've never gauged my success uh, necessarily on the legislation that we pass. It's really the impact it has on my constituents. And we feel that when we get back home and our staff and me personally has to deal with some of the issues. So we, I judge my success on how it's impacting people back home, whether it's good or bad. And uh, there will always, we will always have bills. We're gonna have more than 2,000 bills uh, presented this year. Very few will pass, but the ones that will pass will hopefully be uh, something that, that will not be a burden on the people of the state. Representative Williamson? Sure, obviously anything that we do pass, we want to make sure that it doesn't step on the toes of the freedom um, and, and liberty for the people that we represent. I, I tell people all the time uh, that you sent me to Tallahassee for two things. One, protect your freedom. One, uh, protect your wallet. And uh, so those things are every session are the, the questions that I ask at the end of session. More specifically, to answer the, qu the, the question, I, um, I love the appropriations process. I want to make sure that uh, Senator Broxson and, and Representative Andrade and all of the panhandle uh, legislators that we work together, which we do very well, but that we bring money back home, like I said at the very beginning of the show, we send a lot of money to Tallahassee. We need to be bringing that money home, and that's probably how I will uh, view if I've had success or not according to how much money uh, that I brought home. Sometimes it doesn't happen, um, and, and sometimes you get things through the process and the governor vetoes it. Sometimes they don't make it through the process, uh, and it is a uh, very ever-changing and fluid you know, process that's uh, a lot of uh, different trips and hazards along the way, uh, but still I want to bring those dollars back home. Representative Andrade? Uh, yeah, so, so going a little bit on, on what Senator Broxton and Representative Williamson already said, you can't necessarily gauge your success, uh, you know, in a session based on the number of bills passed or the amount of money. Um, you know, I was, I was lucky enough to have a lot of experience last, my first session, passed nine bills, uh, got several projects funded. Some of them, unfortunately, were vetoed by the governor after the fact, despite, um, you know, the, the work we put into it. And I want to first say how grateful I am to have Representative Williamson serving with me in the Florida House because he's been an incredible mentor and uh, I consider him my, my closest friend over there. Um, I would say, you know, looking back on my first session, uh, the proudest uh, moment that I had, my biggest gauge of success was the fact that, um, you know, I was able to, to work on and, and pass the bill to, to provide death benefits for uh, the families of men and women who serve overseas and die in line of service in the military. Um, and it ties back to uh, what we go over there to do, and that's represent our specific districts. And my specific district is very unique in the fact that it has a lot of veterans in active duty military. Um, so the more um, you know, bills I can tie directly uh, to my district and, and make sure um, you know, I'm, I'm passing bills or advocating for issues that matter the most to my district makes me feel like the best representative I can possibly be. Okay. This will be our final question. So we have about three minutes left. Governor DeSantis has proposed to raise the beginning salary for teachers to, I believe it's about 47,000, 47,500, give or take. Um, so, so that's one thing, kind of your thoughts on that. And then the other the lady is asking, as a 29-year educator in the state, uh, I reached the $50,000 pay mark after approximately 26 years. What will the legislature do to put in place equitable salary adjustments for experienced teachers? And I've got about two and a half minutes. <laughs> that, that is really the question and the answer. I mean, it's great to offer new teachers because we need new teachers. We're short on new teachers. But how do we treat fairly those teachers that's been there for, as this lady, 29 years or 28 years? I, I'm waiting to hear what the governor has to say about that. Uh, and I think the whole legislature is waiting to see because we have a limited amount of money and uh, we, we need to spend it wisely and we need to take care of new teachers, but we also need to take care of those people that have given their life and blood to education for the last 30 or 40 years. Okay. 
I mean, certainly we want to make sure that our teachers are taken care of um, and whether it be new hires, um, but especially the people that have been there uh, for years. But when you look at the budget and, and how it works, maybe it's a $600 million, could be a billion dollar um, type revenue change. Where does that come from? We talked earlier about Florida's tax burden <clears throat> being low. Uh, where does that money, we're not going to generate new uh, money because we're not going to add taxes to the citizens we represent, but uh, where does that money come from? It's going to come from somewhere. If we're not generating new dollars, then it's going to come from somewhere, and we have to look and see what that's going to look like over session. But I'm a product K-12 through Santa Rosa school system. My children go to public schools. Uh, I support public schools, but how does that look? Is That's going to be the... Again, like I've said all night, the devil's in the details. Sure. So, uh, Representative Andrade, I have about a minute left. Your thoughts? Um, so I'm going to go ahead and say that um, it's probably above my pay grade as a first-term legislator um, to dictate that and make that decision. But, um, no, you're, uh, the, the, the person asking the question is absolutely right. Uh, it's not just about uh, you know, first-year teachers. It's about making sure that the teachers who've been out kicking their coverage, who've been outperforming the amount they've been getting paid for years, um, get recognized and, and receive the compensation that they deserve. Um, I have the, uh, sometimes a blessing, sometimes a curse uh, of uh, the, the benefit of having a mother who's been in public education for uh, well over a decade. Um, and she uh, is not shy about sharing her opinion with me. Um, so my hope is, um, you know, while it's above my pay grade, that whatever solution we come up with this year in the legislature um, results in uh, slightly shorter text messages from my mother and maybe a little bit more appreciation and support, <laughs> gotcha. but good. we'll see. Okay, good deal. Well, as I wrap up, I do want to mention one thing. Uh, Senator Broxson, I want to, we want to send out our condolences to your family. Your brother, who was a very well-respected uh, public servant in this area, uh, Senator John Broxson passed away a, a while ago, so our condolences to you and your Thank family. You, and uh, I know he was well respected and and, and loved to serve his uh, his community. So all the best to his um, to, to your family. Thank you. Anyway, gentlemen, thank you so very much. I always enjoy having you guys come in. It's a lot of fun. We have great viewer interaction. We greatly appreciate all of our viewers and listeners. Thank you so much for your questions. It's um, it's great to get the involvement. Our guests this evening have been members of the local Northwest Florida Legislative Delegation, Senator Doug Broxson and Representatives Jayer Williamson and Alex Andrade. Senator George Gaynor and Representatives Mel Ponder and Mike Hill were unable to join us. But we will look forward to having you guys back after the session. Break everything down. That'll be a lot of fun. By the way, tonight's broadcast has come to you from the Phyllis and Mike Johnson studio over the airwaves of WSRE Television. Television PBS for the Gulf Coast. We're also being heard on News Radio 92.3 FM and AM 1620. By the way, this program will be available soon online at WSRE.org as well as on YouTube, so please feel free to share. I'm Jeff Weeks wishing you all the very best. Have yourself a wonderful new year. We'll be talking to you soon. Take care. <laughs>